Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to everybody who's joined us for this event on Reading for Pleasure. I'm Don Wise, Professor of Early Childhood and Primary Education at the IOE, and I'm chairing this evening. I'm particularly interested in the focus tonight, not least because of my own research interest in literacy, as well as on how to develop learners' creativity. Perhaps these topics will feature in this evening's discussion. But we'll also focus on the growing research evidence on the benefits of reading throughout the life course and the implications of that for encouraging more reading for pleasure. We have an eminent panel to help us reflect on those issues who I'll introduce properly in a moment. We'll take some brief opening statements from them and then move on to your comments and questions. Please do use the Q&A feature on Slido to share your views on what you're hearing and do post questions for me to ask the speakers. And I'll do my very best to use as many as I can, but we're, it's very busy tonight. And I think we have more than 450 people signing up, which is amazing. You can also tweet about the event using the hashtag IOE debates. So I'm really pleased to introduce the multi award winning children's author and poet, Joseph Coelho. Joe's celebrated publications include Werewolf Club Rules, Overheard in a Tower Block, and the picture book, If All the World Were, illustrated by Alison Colpoise. Among Joe's new books published just last year are The Girl Who Became a Tree, Zombierella, Fairy Tales Gone Bad, and Thank You. Joe's also found time to write and present Teach Poetry, a BBC online series that aims to make the writing of poetry fun and accessible to all. Charlotte Hacking, another panelist, is from the Centre for Literacy in Primary Education. Charlotte has extensive experience as a teacher of reading across the primary phase, working at school and local authority level. And at CLP, she leads its teaching team and programmes, including the Power of Reading programme, as well as its Power of Pictures, and Power of Poetry research projects concerned with building children's engagement in and enjoyment of reading. Gemma Moss is Professor of Literacy and Director of the International Literacy Centre at the IOE. Gemma's research examines the literacy curriculum and how it evolves, shaped by the shifting relationships between policymakers, practitioners, stakeholders and sometimes the research evidence. That's more provocation there straight away. <laughs> and uh, last but not least on our panel is Alice Sullivan, Professor of Sociology and Head of Research at the IOE's Social Research Institute. From 2010 to 2020, Alice directed one of the UK's internationally renowned birth cohort studies, the 1970 British cohort study which follows the lives of around 17,000 individuals born in 1970. Alice's research uses quantitative and longitudinal data generated by studies like that to analyze educational and social inequalities, including, as we'll hear more of, how they relate to people's reading habits. And so we begin with Joe. Joe, welcome, and we're looking forward to hearing your five minutes. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. I'm coming at this question as a, as a children's author and poet, um, albeit with about 18 years experience working alongside amazing teachers, doing creative writing sessions at a time when creative partnerships was very active. And so we got time to play in the classroom, getting kids engaged with literacy. And one of the things that was very clear very early on is that reading can be so much more than black scratches on paper. Reading can be sound, it can be performance, it can be interactive. And one of the ways that we would engage young people is by honoring their voice and their choices. So honoring their choices by giving them access to lots of different kinds of reading material, but also honoring their voices by making them writers, which might seem counterintuitive, but I found that those children that are writing are reading because by honoring their voice and honoring their passions and their opinions, you get them interested, you get them wanting to put pen to paper. And at first that might just be labeling a picture of something they're interested in. 
but it might also be reviewing, God forbid, Fortnite. I know I can't stand it, but you know, that's what they're into. And, and or unicorns, which all could seem to be into at the moment. So by honoring their voices, honoring their choices, I found that you can then get them into reading more and more and then reading their own stuff, maybe even out loud, reading stuff from their classmates, maybe writing in a group and reading stuff together in a group. And that way you can break down the fear around reading. And there is, there is this massive fear. And I think we all, feel it. As a poet, I definitely see that a lot in schools, especially around poetry, which comes with its own baggage because we've all often had poetry done to us from a very early age. So a lot of uh, the work that I, I do as a visiting author in the classroom is around demystifying words, getting young people to create words, to create poems, to create stories without initially putting pen to paper, just by coming up with a line and memorizing that line and saying it out loud by simply getting them to memorize three lines and saying those three lines out loud, you've got a short little poem, a short little moment, a short opportunity for, for them to share their voice and for you to honor what it is that they are saying. And it's something that kids do all the time in the playground through all the kind of little ditties that they learn that we probably, you know, thinking back a long time now that we can remember doing in the playground. I also feel this, concept of kind of getting kids to read for pleasure is um, helped greatly by access to books, by libraries and independent bookshops and bookshops. And that's so key. It was my local library that made me a reader, made me a writer. I didn't grow up in a house full of books. If I didn't have local access to a library, I probably wouldn't be a reader now. I had to be able to walk to it because we didn't have a car and I wasn't going to get on a bus to go to the next town along. So it had to be a library nearby and, and it had to be a library in schools. And I think libraries are so key as well because it allows for that incidental discovery of books, something which the digital age can't really offer us. It's amazing that we can do things like this, but you can't browse a bookshop digitally. Digitally, we are constrained by algorithms and we get more of the same. Whereas in a bookshop, in a library, you can browse. And I would come out of my local library with books about ghosts and UFOs and mysteries and beachcombing and Romans. And that could only happen because I was able to discover. And it's about giving young people the opportunities to discover books, to discover their passions, to discover themselves. Um, I'm going to uh, read for you um, a poem about my love, about libraries, and about this act of discovery. It's called, There Are Things That Lurk in the Library. There are things that lurk in the library, that thumb and squeeze between the leaves. New words can be found in the books. Characters listen to all that you read. There are whisperings between the words and shivers rearing to leap on your spine. Run your fingertips along the spine. Feel the bones of each book in your library. Watch the maze as the muscle words flex, robbed of the will to leave. You are compelled to stay and read. There are words to be found in these books. There are worlds to be found in these books. Ideas that wise minds have opined, tales of the deepest read, unknown narratives skulk in this library, where parables rustle like leaves, where mouths taste new words. There are sagas in you if you look inward. Your whole life could be read as a book. All your fears bound into uncut leaves. Fairy tales are written on your spine. Every wrinkle has its own library. Every crease is waiting to be read. We leave volumes wherever we tread. Every sigh has its own hidden word. Every hug is its own library. Every goodbye, a dog-eared book, every choice, bound to a moral spine, a story we can never leave. As your book forms its leaves, as you leave a story for others to read, make sure you bind well your spine. Don't let the ink smudge on a word, for you yourself are a book. You yourself are a library. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what a way to start with a performance. It's wonderful. And to hear your, um, your thoughts on the topic. So over to Charlotte. Thank you very much, Dom. I'm just going to share a few visuals as I talk. I'm coming from the place uh, in between 
the research and the practice in the classroom. At CLP, we like to talk to teachers about how to develop policy to integ with integrity, integrity to what makes good reading happen. And I think when we're looking at the current picture regarding reading for pleasure, there's three key elements for me. It's how it's viewed in the education system, how the enabling adults around the child view reading and how they engage with the text and support their readers and what the texts are. What are the texts that are valued? What are the texts that are available? What are the texts that are accessible to children? Because if those things work in harmony to foster reading engagement and attainment, children will engage in purposeful talk. They'll raise their self-esteem. They will attain as we want them to attain and they will be reading for pleasure. They'll engage more reading in reading more often. They'll get better at it. They'll feel better about it. When we're looking at these elements, I think the most important one for me as a provocation to start off with is how reading's viewed in the education system. If we look at this, when we have a system that sets accountable reading milestones like this, what does it say to our children and to our teachers about reading and what's valued in the teaching of reading? And for me, how does that mean reading resources are going to be prioritised as a result of this? What is the range and breadth and quality of the reading material that children have available? And what does that reading material say to them about reading? Does it say it's a pleasurable experience? Now, actually, this is one of the texts that was used in that 2019 Key Stage 2 reading assessment that I showed, but it was presented in a very different way. If texts like this are valued and they're shared well, they are the kinds of texts that are are going to develop the language, the comprehension skills that we want measured, not just in assessment, but just in a much wider range of skills and greater depth of understanding. However, that's just one text. We need to make sure that children encounter a much wider range to be able to see what reading is, but also what it could be, and most importantly, what's in it for them. But think about all the videos we've had about the assessment for reading, the guidance videos. Do we see a range of texts in these? And when we look at those videos, what are the books that are most highly valued? It's the pinnacle of the novel. When we're gamifying reading in that way, and when we're prioritising the value of some texts over others, the pleasure of reading is way out of reach for some children. You can see this uh, DJ, a year four child, saying here that he's got Wimpy Kid at home, but he's not allowed to read it because the quiz he's taking at school says that's not a book for him. But he doesn't understand that. He doesn't know why it's not right for him because it's not that hard. Now, that's where we're at. But where do we actually want to be? Now, way back in the 1970s, Margaret Meek was talking about how in all the books she read about reading and teaching reading, there was scarcely a mention about what was to be read. What if a whole range of books and reading were explicitly and openly valued and prioritised in the curriculum and in any assessment of reading? And what if assessment valued teachers professional knowledge and practice to build a wide and varied picture of readers? When we talk about text value, our recent research at CLP shows how varied the reading of children and teachers is and the stark difference between what children's literature, upper key stage two children are reading and what children's literature the teachers read. What if we had a broad perspective of what reading is? We understood more about what children like to read and why, and we were given the time, space and support to shape collections and recommendations that built on that. What if we as adults were encouraged to develop our perceptions of what good reading is and what age appropriate texts are? What if we had access to lots of texts at the beginning of children's reading journeys that enable children to use and apply phonic knowledge in the context of great stories and pleasurable reading? Now, one of the questions that was posed in Twitter prior to this were, what were the books that made you a reader? Well, these were three of mine. I could tell you why they engaged me. Picture books and poetry have lived with me for the whole of my life. I was obsessed with Rosie's Walk because of Pat Hutchins' illustrations. I loved the rhythms in Brian Patton's poetry and I wanted to be Nancy Drew. Could all the children you work with know and name and talk about books in that way? What if they don't have those books? How do we open the door to pleasurable reading for them? And what if the books aren't out there that enable that deeper level of engagement and pleasure? Or what if there's not enough of them yet? What if every child could see themselves in books so they find books they connect with and enjoy? That's why at CLPE, we engage in our reflective realities research, reviewing the quantity and quality of representation of UK children's literature and publishing our findings in this report. 
What if we all had the time, as Aidan Chambers modelled in his reading environment diagram, the reading circle, what if we all had the time, the space and the expertise to engage in and develop reading for pleasure with our children? As enabling adults, where do we go for advice on selections? How do we dedicate time to reading for pleasure in a pressurised curriculum? And how do we engage in discussions around reading where the purpose is to enjoy reading, make deeper connections with a text rather than finding a right or wrong answer or achieve a score? It's about time to read. It's about hearing it done. It's about doing it yourself. It's about having choice and voice and engaging with the creators of texts like Joe. It's about finding your favourites and seeing that reading is a place for you. That's where we get children who want to engage. And that's where we get that magic place in the centre of that diagram. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. And how extraordinary literature is seeing those Nancy Drew mysteries took me back and I had a lot of interest in whodunits including uh, those, so wow. I'm gonna make very quick reference to a question from Natalie McCabe that came in earlier. And Natalie asks about how we decipher between quality of different books, which you were talking about, Charlotte. And, uh, but Natalie draws attention to a distinction between high quality children's literature and celebrity author children's books. I'm going to leave that one hanging um, and turn to Gemma for her five minutes. Okay, well, I'm switching from the world of the author and the world of practice. And I loved what both Charlotte and Joe said. They've shown us what a wonderful world reading can represent and the kinds of different pleasures it can give children if they are engaged. Given it's such a self evidently good idea why doesn't it happen for everyone that's one of the biggest dilemmas um, and it's something that I've been looking at for a very long time now for much of my professional career um, I've used both qualitative and quantitative approaches and they show us different things my first research in this area was looking at what happened in around reading in primary schools at a time when I'd, um, I was an ex-secondary school teacher. I had no idea what primary schools did. I went in as an ethnographer and looked at four different primary schools, two of them working in contexts of high disadvantage, two of them working with quite middle class catchments. And I found myself learning a whole new vocabulary, independent reader, chapter books, read alones all of which are setting out for the children in the school that reading is on a proficiency ladder. And Charlotte in one of her um, slides showed us that, you know, there's the blue group. We all know the blue group, the red group, the yellow group, those are arbitrary names and yet they signify something. And part of what happens for children when they enter school is that they learn they will be sorted according to their proficiency as readers. Their proficiency as readers really matters. It matters very strongly from a very early age. We should all be concerned about it. We are all concerned about it, of course. But actually, if you go solely on proficiency, you also deny children the pleasure of choosing and choice. Now, for me, that dilemma between proficiency and choice is something that all children have to navigate. All adults have to navigate, including the teachers in the classroom. All parents have to navigate. My first child taught himself how to read before he went to school. My daughter was kind of, yeah, she was only just beginning to sort it out at age seven. Same household, same background, different times that it took to get to grips with the task. Yet we live now in a, a, a curriculum that insists there will be uniform delivery at a uniform pace. And what happens if you take longer is that you simply are pushed down into the struggling reader category, the one we're all concerned about. Now that has two different effects in the classroom. One is that children really know that and notice it. And in my research consistently, I've looked at the gender dimension to noticing. There is a very strong gender dimension to noticing. If you look at how boys labeled less proficient readers react to the label, 
never mind the skill, react to the label. They do quite different things from girls, labelled less proficient readers. And girls through their social networks will stay engaged. They have friendship groups that will encourage them, that don't belittle them because they're reading an easy book. Whereas boys find themselves in a competitive environment where they will do everything to disguise the fact that they are struggling to read. Now, in my research database, that led boys to choose what I would call highly visual nonfiction, Dawling Kindersley books, where you can navigate the entire thing via the pictures, you don't have to bother with the text. Great for self-esteem, doesn't actually help them solve their reading problems. So that tension between proficiency and choice is something that we have to enable children to navigate better than they otherwise can. Unfortunately, the current curriculum doesn't do that. If you struggle, you get locked in with the most uninteresting books, with the most distorted grammar, reflecting just decodable words that you have to learn and that your standing as a reader will probably become triply visible very quickly in the classroom. We have to find a way out of this. Um, it matters because it impacts and here I just want to turn briefly to two qualities quantitative research projects. I've run one looking at the Millennium Cohort Studies, where we actually track back children who did more or less well aged 11 to look at what their childhood experiences are. Actually, boys and girls are not taken different times to the library. Their parents don't spend different amounts of time reading to them. But if you look at boys or girls who struggle with language and literacy skills on entry, a7, girls who on the same low proficiency on entry are reading more widely and they go on to do better at 11. So we have to somehow crack that social status around struggling with reading in the early years and help children enjoy that full range of reading experience that is waiting for them. Why does it matter? Because reading for pleasure actually teaches you more than a teacher can teach you. It actually is a self fueling phenomenon. And the other bit of quantitative research I've done with my colleague John Jerram here at the Institute of Education looking at the PISA data set, we explored via PISA whether the time spent reading impacts on higher attainment. So what's the correlation and whether what you read makes a difference. And the answer is, interestingly enough, that the what you read does make a difference that reading fiction has more benefits than reading comics, magazines or non-fiction. But I think that's because people who read fiction read for longer. They get immersed in a text that is longer. And over time, that text makes you reinterpret the vocabulary that it's offering you in different kinds of ways. It offers you multiple different perspectives. It engages you more in actively thinking than if you're flicking through the pages of a football magazine. All right, so there are different kinds of pleasures. We want children to feel agency around the choices that they exercise. Yes, that creates difficulties in the early years as children develop their skills, but we must keep on working at that tension point and help children, parents, teachers resolve it so that everybody can enjoy what reading can offer all of us in those many different ways that Charlotte and Joe have flagged up. Thank you so much, Gemma. I'm going to bring Alice in momentarily, and Gemma's already made a very helpful link to the cohort studies, which I'm sure we shall hear a little more about. Uh, also, what you, you and Charlotte have done already is, to some degree, um, talk to a question raised by Sarah Selesnyov, which was, to what extent did the panel think the SPAG test and the associated focus on the teaching of grammar and spelling across primary schools limit schools' capacity to develop reading for pressure? Well, I think some of those issues are beginning to surface. And just, I'll just say, by the way, that um, I feel slightly ashamed that I'm in a room completely devoid of any books at all, and my panellists have got lovely uh, pictures and uh, uh, my defences are I'm decorating. <laughs> anyway, over to you, Alice. Thank you. Um, so I think we all know that um, bright children, children who are doing well in school, tend to read for pleasure more than their less skilled peers. But what my research has looked at is um, what's the relationship with reading for pleasure and learning? Um, does reading for pleasure actually increase the rates of children's learning? 
and I looked at that using the 1970 British cohort study, which follows the lives of more than 17,000 people who were born in Britain in a single week in 1970. And it's really an amazing study. Every few years, we interview the same people um, to track different aspects of their lives, their family lives, education, employment, physical and mental health. Um, so a whole wide range of things. And that's an approach that lets us look at what influences an individual's development over a really long period of time. So um, when the 1970 people uh, get children, well, they're not children anymore, but when they were young, we were able to look at um, children from the same socioeconomic backgrounds who'd had similar test scores um, at the ages of five and 10. So essentially look at like, compare like with like. And what we found was that those who read books frequently at the ages of 10 and 16 learned more in terms of not just in terms of vocabulary, um, but also in terms of maths between the ages of 10 and 16. So reading for pleasure was linked to greater learning, but actually the size of that effect was really, really striking. So reading frequently um, the impact of that was about four times greater than that of having a parent with a university degree. Now, as someone who's um, a sociologist of education, we know that you know a parent with uh, with higher education is a huge predictor of doing well. So to have something that's four times greater than that is it, it was really uh, the size of the result was quite striking. Now, in, in some ways, it shouldn't surprise anybody, of course, reading and reading books in particular introduces young people to new words. So, of course, reading for pleasure increases your, your vocabulary development. Um, but some people have been surprised that we also found a link between reading for pleasure and progress in maths. Um, I think it actually it does make sense because if you think about it, reading for pleasure introduces young people to new ideas. Um, it, it helps them to understand and absorb new information and concepts. And I think independent reading probably also promotes a more self-sufficient approach to learning in general. And that's something that I've been thinking about at, at the moment um, during the COVID pandemic with schools closed, how important those self-sufficient learning skills actually are. Um, but we didn't leave it there. So uh, with, at, at age 16, we've our, our cohort members, 1970 cohort, of course, are 50 years old now. We've kept following them up every few years. Um, in 2012, when they were 42, we actually got them to do exactly the same vocabulary test that they had done at age 16. So that was quite exciting because it allowed us to find out whether they'd carried on learning new words. And good news, yes, they did keep learning new words. So learning doesn't stop at school. And we also asked them about their reading not just how much reading, but what they read. And this is interesting because it confirms what Gemma just said. Reading um, continued to develop their, um, their vocabularies over time up to age 42. And it was those that read demanding fiction that actually learned the most new words um, compared to those who were reading factual literature or who were reading um, only less demanding fiction. So what do we take from all of this? Um, I think many people are concerned that young people now are reading less for pleasure in their spare time than previous generations, partly because they've got less spare time. Um, and that's partly about the demands of schooling and homework. And it's partly about the internet and all the other demands on young people's time, all the activities they do. You know, um, in the 70s and 80s, we were allowed to get bored and just um, open a book. And that's, that's changed a lot. So, the research that I've done suggests that that's really quite worrying if it, if it is the case that they're reading less, because it is likely to negatively affect their intellectual development. And we also know that reading for pleasure tends to decline in secondary school. And so I would really um, re-emphasize actually what Joe was saying, um, which really resonated with me about the importance of libraries, um, being able to walk to the local library um, as a child. That was something that I did very frequently to sort of top up on books. 
and the importance of schools, libraries and school librarians being able to provide access to a, a range of books, but also to provide access to the knowledge that uh, parents may not have, helping young people to discover the authors that they will actually enjoy. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Alice, and all of our speakers tonight. Um, we're working perfectly to time, which is good. We have now um, up to half an hour to get our teeth into some of the questions that the audience have been asking. I'm just going to start with a, what I suspect will be a relatively quick one for Joe. Um, Vicky Fenton asks, will there be any more fairy tales gone bad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a lovely question. Yes, book two is uh, coming out this year. I'm currently writing book three and there's a lot more ideas um, coming. So yes, thank you. Brilliant. Great to hear. Um, and now I think um, probably Charlotte might begin with, with something on this. Um, Maureen Labai says, how can we reach black and other ethnic minority groups through mainstream books? I'd really recommend going to uh, the CLP website and reading the Reflecting Realities report that I mentioned in my presentation. It's quite difficult because there's not enough out there at the minute. This has been a, a conversation that's been going on for far too long. You know, back in the 80s, people like Verna Wilkins were talking about how we needed to have more books that reflected the lives of children in our classrooms. We have a quick spurge of activity on it and books come out and then the conversation dies off and we don't see enough. What we wanted to do at CLP was to continue to keep a spotlight on it so that we continue to make sure that new books, new authors were coming into the market and that all children could see not only themselves but the lives of others so that it accurately reflects what's happening in society today this isn't just about um, servicing one group of people it's about benefiting the whole um, but look for the good ones that are out there one of the ones that I had in my slides was Jabari, uh, Jabari Tries which is the sequel to Jabari Jumps it's a beautiful book for any child about self-esteem about taking risks about getting things wrong and trying again and actually all of the attributes you need as a good reader as well um, go to, as Alice said, go to people who know the books to recommend. They're not the books you're going to see on the shelves in the mainstream booksellers or in the supermarkets. You need to go to booksellers like Letterbox Library, like Roundtable Books, like Moon Lane Inc. Go to your local independent booksellers who will much have a much larger range and look for the smaller publishers who are publishing much more in this area. Lantana, Alana Max, Otterbury Books. Tony Al, all of those people who are striving to get knights of, who are striving to get uh, more representative literature into the market. Brilliant. Lots more recommendations in Reflecting Realities, though, that I've got time to talk about here. And the focus of the report this year has really shifted from the quality to the quantity of the representation, sorry, quantity to the quality of the representations, which is really important alongside as well. Thank you. Um, I think I might turn to Alice. Um, there's a question here from Marika um, Eason. Is there any benefit? I beg your pardon, no, that's not the one. The question I want is actually from Dipesh Shah. How to encourage parents to help children reading for pleasure? Well, Alice, if you've got any thoughts on that from your extensive work. I suppose it depends very much on the age. I mean, we know that if parents read to their children um, when they're young, that that is an influential thing that they can do. Um, I think also if you're a child and you see your parents reading for pleasure in their own right, um, that that will encourage you to think that that is a pleasurable activity but of course not every parent is going to um, enjoy reading and some parents obviously will struggle with their own literacy and that will pose a real barrier for them in terms of encouraging their own children to read so I think that's um, that's where we can't place the full onus on parents because not all of not all parents will have those resources and that's where I think schools and libraries are also really really important. Mm. Thank you. Um, I might just throw in one of my own reflections and queries. Um, I'm aware of the research that both you and Gemma were talking about um, in relation to <coughs> the, the, um, the value of fiction. Uh, 
narrative fiction literature. And my instinct, although I absolutely recognize the value of fiction, my instinct is to get slightly worried about that. Um, only because the, some people and some children simply love reading nonfiction, read, uh, and yes, the, the comics, the magazines, uh, and I must admit that at the heart of what I believe is, is about, and someone else asked a question about this actually, sort of along the lines of does it, does it matter too much uh, what children read as long as they're reading? And I think the, the person, yes, I've got, okay, Gemma, the person said that, that at secondary school they're being discouraged to read a certain type of text. Gemma, go on. <laughs> I think there are two different things going on. One is how do we encourage and engage? And I want to come back to what Alice was talking about. S family homes where there are very few books. Now this isn't necessarily a straight correlation with income. I can think of um, a children living in one room bedsit with siblings and parent having been made homeless, no resources, very little income. They'd the child had amassed a, a, a good library reflecting her own interests from spending very little money in charity shops and she kept it all in a special place. So mm. it doesn't necessarily correlate with income, but equally there are homes where the only books that go home are the books the school sends. Okay, think about that a minute. If the book is only sending home decodable phonics texts and turning this into work, what is that child's experience of reading? So class really matters. The interesting side of the PISA analysis that John Jerram did is that actually the correlation between high reading of fiction and higher attainment holds regardless of gender and SES. That's interesting. So it has a kind of protective effect. The other thing is not in the published paper. I actually got him to explore the difference in the text type made, um, looking at Japan along with English speaking countries. And I chose Japan quite deliberately because I know they have a lot of manga comics. All right, so if you're choosing to read comics in Japan, you are reading complex texts where a lot of the inference is going on in the visuals. The correlation between high reading of fiction did not hold as well in, in Japan as it did in the rest of the English speaking world. So we always have to be careful. I, I think though that there is something about letting, for instance, boys get away with choosing books where they're not really engaging with text, they're just skipping over the visuals. Yeah. If you think about horrible histories, horrible histories may qualify as nonfiction. It's also narrative. So, you know, some of the categories blur. I think what we want is, I think the difference is it's giving that, it's what we came to describe readers who are passionate about reading as committed readers. They would dip out of social media, all the chit chat and the rest of it and spend an extended period of time actually immersed in something. You get that immersion from good fiction. I've just read Hamnet. I couldn't put it down. It, it is the most mesmerizing book. It's also deeply upsetting. It left me in tears. It involved me in a way that I don't think, you know, a discourse on, well, I've also been reading about the Black Tudors in, in, in as nonfiction. It was a different kind of reading experience. Tom, could I just pick up on something as well there? I think the important thing about those other kinds of reading is that's the place to find the starting point. And then where do you take the child next? If you know they like comics, where's the next part to that? How do we get them into the more stamina building graphic novels? So it's about valuing where their starting points are, but knowing as the enabling adult, that person at the center of the reading circle, what have you got in your selection? How do you respond to that kind of reading and where do you take them next? Thank you. Um, Joe, something that occurred to me, um, of course, uh, writing is closely connected to reading. Um, and I wonder if poetry and understanding about poetry writing is perhaps something of a Cinderella of the, of the literacy curriculum. Um, but I wondered if you had any things, you know, that from your experience about the reading and writing of poetry. Uh, yeah, I've there's definitely that fear 
in terms of writing poetry because it's considered as something it has a lot of baggage it's considered as something which is difficult needs to be analyzed need to be needs to be done in the correct way mm. um and I, I i've lost count of the amount of time sort of going into schools where you know i've had teachers and parents say oh yeah but maybe maybe not call it poetry let's not call it poetry let's say they're doing lyrics let's say they're doing rhymes and and just this this fear which is then passed on to the kids because the kids take on our own adult fears in the same way that they take on our own values you know if we're valuing um novels more highly than other reading materials the kids take that on so there's a lot of work to be done with the with the adults in general um but that's why i i think it's so key to kind of demystify and break down what what poetry can be and poetry can be a ditty in a card it can be a, a riddle it can it can as well as being a sonnet you know, but um i often get kids to to write sonnets and to write villanelles and sestinas even though it you you wouldn't naturally go there because it, it's seen as too complex but actually it's a pattern and kids use patterns in their daily speech all the time. They use poetic devices. And it's such a shame that we think that these uh, devices that they're using on a daily basis are alien to them. They use it in the playground. Yeah, Gemma, you wanted to say something about uh, poetry and book gender, I think. Well, poetry is where popular culture and literature overlaps. And one of the findings in our research is that actually boys were often much more interested in poetry than classrooms gave them credit for. They're nice short texts, but they're also demanding. They make you think. They make you invest in inference and all of those other exciting things that happens when you get really involved in reading. So poetry can be a good way into actually getting a kind of really lively experience from reading that you want to repeat and yes, be able to move on to to other texts. So I think what Joe's doing is a great job. And so and now here's a crunch. Cr oh, Joe, did you want to come back in? Yeah, we, just, to, just to add to what Jeremy was saying, that it, it is, I do see it as a kind of a, a gateway, a gateway drug for reading, because especially at the moment, there's so many exciting texts with you know, verse novels and a complete range of kind of complexity. So mm -hmm. you could you know, start off with, I mean, you, you know, right to the, the, the silly humorous poems which there's totally a need and a value in leading right up to far more complex novels you know and that, which are now it's interesting that they are now entering into the adult market so I, I think that's a great way to get kids interested and then to to move them up not move them up but you know <laughs> see that's the problem <laughs> move them to other areas I should say <laughs> Uh, here, I think, is the crunch question of the night, given it's all about reading for pleasure. Um, Therese Castillo asks, what happens when the child does not want to read at all? Is it proper to put a book in front of them even when they refuse? Open to anyone. <laughs> well, one thing I will say, I have a nephew who is profoundly dyslexic and who struggled with reading at school. Um, continues to struggle to some extent with reading and writing as an adult. But what his mother, my sister, did for him when he was younger is made sure that she carried, kept open the offer to read to him right the way through his schooling. She was still reading to him when he was an adolescent. Now, obviously, the content had changed. But actually, if you uh, he, he visited India and wrote a blog about his visit. And you can hear the rhythms that he picked up from all of the literature that she'd read to him, even if maybe he couldn't have deciphered it for himself. So there are other ways of engaging children and keeping them going that introduces them to the language of literacy, even when they are struggling themselves to decipher and decode. Yeah, and picking up on, yeah, Joe, go. Uh, yeah, I, I think as well, that if the focus is on reading and, and the kid is against reading, that becomes very difficult. But if the focus is on interest and passions, you can sort of for, forget reading. And I often do this with writing. It's like, I don't talk about writing at all. Talk about what they're interested in and then they will naturally end up writing or reading as, as a result. So I think it's about taking the emphasis off of, off of the R's. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I think I would agree with that as well, that you don't want to engage in an argument. You don't want to make it a confrontational thing. You want to, because you're never going to get the enjoyment if you do that. I would absolutely agree with Gemma that the offer to read aloud continues to be an important one. And especially now, if we're not as teachers reading to our children all the time um, in this remote landscape, that's the best thing that we could do. But also show people like Joe reading poems so that it's not you know necessarily the teacher as the reader or the parent as the reader it's somebody else just doing a great performance that you can engage with it's not about the reading or if they're interested in wildlife show them David Attenborough look at the language and grammar structures that he uses that shows how to put an information text of that kind to a reader. Mm. I think building on what you've been saying there's another question from Slido um, could there be a moralizing as aspect to the expectation that children must read quotes for pleasure? Do we have the same expectation in other areas of learning? <laughs> maths for pleasure, for example. Not that I've got anything against maths. <laughs> I think it is an interesting thing about reading for pleasure. By definition, you cannot force someone to read for pleasure. Um, all you can do is uh, try to to hope to nourish that pleasure. Um, so yeah, it's quite right that you you can't just tell people to read for pleasure. But just as just as in any other subject, if kids are enjoying it, then they're going to get an awful lot more out of it. And I think when Emma when sorry when Gemma said, you know, if you read for pleasure, it will give you far more than any teacher can. I think that's absolutely right because it kind of puts that learning on steroids and makes it independent. I think it's back to making, helping the child to see what reading has to offer them. And again, all the different types of reading. You can read for pleasure. I, I can't tell you how many hours my daughter has played Animal Crossing during lockdown, but you can read for pleasure playing Animal Crossing. There's a purpose to it. There's a pleasure that you get out of interacting with the characters on there. We've, we've got to see reading in different ways and, and allow those pathways to flow into where the pinnacle of where we want to get to is which the is children seeing what it offers. For the uninitiated, a quick description of Animal Crossing. So Animal Crossing is the Nintendo's biggest game of the moment. It's, yes. it's actually brilliant for literacy building. So you're, in, you're a, an owner of an island and you get to build your own island and you have residents who come to you and there's a lot of reading that you have to do as part of the game on the screen. All your interactions come up as text to read on the screen. So yes, lots of children I'm sure are engaging at the minute. Gemma? There really is more than one way into becoming a committed reader. And I think that's what this panel is saying collectively. You can't make it a moral imperative and then insist. But I'm immediately recalling the teacher who faced with a class of, um, they were year four, year five children. And there was a whole gaggle of boys who never read anything. So actually what she did was choose texts that had got gripping beginnings, read the first chapter aloud in the class and then say, who wants to borrow it? Yeah. So that she was continually trying to set up an enticement to read, not a kind of moral imperative. I'm going to find out, you know, tell me how many books you've read in the last week. You haven't read enough. And interestingly, you're reminding me of one of the weirder projects that I did do combining Quant and Qual. We analysed um, the library borrowing records of a cohort of 90 children, 60 of whom were bar boys over an entire year. And what you could see by looking at the order in which children were taking their books out on the auto desk was who was kind of connected to which child and who was passing which book on to which child. The fact if you can create a living community of readers in a classroom, if you can give them space to say this one's good, don't bother with that one, that one's rubbish, you know, then you're enticing children uh, as a peer group to invest in each other. And also for those children who are struggling, this is really important information. Which are the books it's worth struggling with because you're going to get something out of it. it that, kind of information needs to be passed around on children's own peer networks and it's why I think it's where our current curriculum goes wrong particularly in the early years where reading for choice is the prerogative of the teacher who will spend some time choosing a text and then reading it to the children assuming they will be engaged that's not enough 
to entice children and to bring them into a world of enjoyment that they really can get for reading for themselves by self-directing it. Yeah, and I think we're now <coughs> hovering and we need to, we've got um, about 10 minutes left. I think we really need to think about digital texts and some of those implications. But before we do, um, Twitter poll results to this question. What for you is the main obstacle to reading more books? 44% um, said lack of leisure time, 55% said my devices, and 11% said something else. And then on Slider, the, the same question, but slightly different results. 68% lack of leisure time, 16% my devices, 16% something else. So, um, I, and there was a question actually about um, digital, um, yes, here we are. So it's a question on Slido. Um, how in the age of technology, animated stories on iPads, TVs, etc., can we motivate parents and children to read more? How can we make it more attractive? That presupposes certain things, obviously, but um, any thoughts around that or those things, digital and otherwise? I, I think there's, a, there's still a bit of a, a, a fear around sort of digital text or, and, and, and a bit of a hierarchy. Sometimes people are like, oh, reading, yeah, reading digitally, oh no, a proper book. And yes, I think majority of people like the feel of a, of a real book. Yeah, but um, there's a great deal of benefit and I, in reading digitally. And now with, you know, tablets that we have, you can really, really appreciate a, a picture book, for example, digitally. And I think it's a, letting people know those options. I think many people don't realize you can get things like picture books on a tablet in full color, you know, and you can turn the pages. And rather than just giving the kid a tablet or a phone to play a game uh, on, which I, you see a lot of parents doing, you know, I can totally understand, you know, but uh, if you let them know there's that option of actually you can view a book and you can borrow a book from your library digitally and, and read it in that way. So I think it's a lack of information at the moment. Yeah, yeah, and someone else said, um, do you think schools and parents are not fostering reading habits amongst young children, particularly during lockdown with tablet use increasing? I think coming back off what Joe was saying as well, I, I, I think the thing with digital text is not to see them as something that the child just does by themselves. It's like a TV programme. There's lots of TV programmes out there, you know, particularly the, the CBBS content is great for young children, but only if they've got an engaged adult. Again, they're having the conversations, drawing the responses out and explaining the language with them. It's that... We, we, have re we have such a view that reading is a one-to-one -one thing between the child and the book. Actually, we're going to open it out when we bring the adult in there or other children in there to open up those conversations, to get different responses, to consolidate ideas, yeah. for other people to bring shared perspectives or different perspectives to it. And I think it's the quality, it's encouraging not just the act of reading, but the conversations around reading that will enhance that. Um, where time is moving on, I'm, I'm going to invite you all in, in a moment to, to offer just a couple of final remarks, no more than a minute each, please. Um, just before that, um, a couple of things that were on my mind. Um, one is in terms of the motivation for reading, and of course, and there was all that stuff about moralising intent and so on. But um, the other side of this is the risk to damaging existing motivation. So I remember from my own, I think, secondary schooling, someone well-meaning person saying, um, shouldn't you be paying more attention to your O-level text as it was then? Whereas I was happily plowing through the marvelous trash of James Herbert um, and, and horror stories and things, you know, which I was perfectly happy with. But it actually did, it did kind of stop me reading for, for quite a period because I had this kind of conflict. Um, the other thing was a word that Gemma mentioned in passing, um, agency. And I'm, uh, as she knows, I'm sort of a bit preoccupied with this, but it relates to me for this whole idea of reading for pleasure because it is an agentic choice and that has to be encouraged I think and developed anyway in order of my the people on my screen Gemma would you like to just say a couple of final remarks before we close 
Well, agency does depend upon resource and we can't underestimate the importance of resources. I think what the, the discussion of digital also reveals is we have to think about the context in which resources are shared. Those matter. I do wonder if during this pandemic, instead of putting all the emphasis on getting laptops to kids who can't use them because they don't have Wi-Fi at home or uh, phones when parents are unwilling, they can't, they, they run out of their, their subscription service as it were and it costs too much. Why hadn't the government simply made a commitment that it would deliver to every child in every family a book every week to keep them reading? <laughs> I mean, it's, it would probably be cheaper. It would probably be more effective. And, you know, there are corporate sponsors out there that could have got to join in. That would probably have done better as a way of using up children's time profitably during lockdown rather than what we're currently asking schools to do, which is scramble to deliver a curriculum as if everybody was still in school they're not they're at home let's set up some book clubs for children while they're at it a proper allocation of food reflecting the funding that's there charlotte i think the resource is the same for me know your books have books that reflect your current children have things that reflect their needs and interests build the spine that take them from where they are from where you want them to be that give them a range and breadth and know where to go if you don't know those things there's the brilliant work teresa kremen's doing around reading for pleasure there's magazines like books for keeps there's the school's library service there's clp's core book list there are lots and lots of recommendations out there look at the prizes get the book Books that entice your children to see that reading is delicious and they all want to be engaged in it. Yeah, and I'm going to come to Joe then. Alice, um, there's another <coughs> point made, by, this time by Mark Quinn. Libraries are closed due to the pandemic. What damage to kids' enjoyment of reading result from long term library closure? Well, Joe, you've already spoken eloquently about the need. In fact, you all have. We, I think we're in agreement, firm agreement about the importance of libraries. Joe, a couple of final remarks. Um, I think for, for all of us as a society as a whole to sort of challenge our own kind of uh, misconceptions about books and hierarchy and that goes for like you know picture books versus all oh, novels and chapter books and and just to allow books to be books and words and stories and poems to breathe and for passion to run through um, everything and and to encourage young people to become more familiar with the objects of books. We're in such a wonderful age in that there are so many of these lovely, beautifully produced books with hard covers and, and textured elements. And that's why I think libraries are really key because you can go into the libraries when they're open and you can take out these expensive, beautiful books and engage with the beauty of a book and to see ourselves as writers. writers writing isn't just for writers, it's for everyone and if we see ourselves as writers and yeah the British Library is doing great work at the moment getting people to produce little I'm not sure if you can say, mini books there's loads of free online resources where you can create mini books so if you can get kids excited about the object of a book and how they can create their own little stories and have their words valued you're far more likely to get them engaged in the wider world of books in general. Brilliant uh, Alice over to you. So we're, com we're going to be coming out of lockdown with learning gaps massively increased during the period of school closures. Um, we know that, yes, there are, there are differences in school quality between schools, but they're as nothing compared to the differences in the capacity of different families, and the, the resources, all sorts of different resources that they have um, to help their children learn. So we really need to be thinking about what we're going to do as we come out to help those kids who've really suffered the most. And reading and libraries, I think, have to be a huge part of that because there is really nothing that compares to reading in terms of um, how it enhances people's learning and in the long term will enable them to weather these kinds of shocks if you can, if you can read and you're an independent learner then you can do quite well regardless of your circumstances and if you're not then uh, then it looks very different and even as an adult I think I feel really sorry at the moment for people who don't enjoy reading <laughs> because you know it's a it's a massive consolation yeah yeah well 
Thank you ever so much. I'm going to start by thanking what the 166 viewers. Um, now, the reason I know this is because Kate and Matt have so expertly helped me and all of us with the technology for, oh, hang on, <laughs> update from Matt, 190, brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Panelists, thank you. Um, I've learned a huge amount by listening to you. Uh, and I'm sure everyone has, and um, it's been such an engaging, fascinating conversation. Um, so all I need to say now is thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>